Okay, welcome to the sound training. Ian Patterson, he knows his stuff. I used to work with him on KSTP. He's great. He knows a lot of stuff that we need to really start to work into. And so let's go through this PowerPoint and then we'll have questions and answers. So we'll have the three sessions. Basically, we'll try to get through most of the meat by lunch, take a lunch break, and then we come back. So, yeah. And I was kind of thinking this would be more free flowing too. Don't feel uh, you know, afraid to just raise your hand and jump in if you've got questions anytime. So uh, you don't have to necessarily wait for the Q&A session. But yeah, like you said, uh, I got my start in pro audio at church um, and just really dove in and I got really excited about it and um, ran audio at my church for about 15 years. Uh, and I was very fortunate to have some really incredible teachers and um, a church leadership that was highly invested in um, really high quality, um, you know, production. And they were willing to invest in really good gear and training for their uh, musicians and their worship teams. Um, and so uh, I, I was at the right place at the right time to really absorb a lot of really great information. So um, that experience was what landed me the job at KSTP. Um, so <clears throat> I no longer work there now. I'm, I've since moved on and I'm working in IT, um, but still have a great passion for pro audio and uh, for helping other people who are interested in it to get uh, to the next level. So um, I'll have my contact info at the end of the slide. You can feel free to contact me anytime if you got questions, anything like that. But you know, obviously, Schmidt is a great resource for that stuff too. Um, just a note on these handouts: we're not going to really go through them too much. These are more just for your own reference for later. These are um, some of the uh, rain white papers that helped me when I was, you know, stuck or <laughs> um, when I've come to. Um, you know, they're just a really good resource for what we're going to be talking about, specifically about, um, you know, acoustics in the contemporary church, um, that kind of stuff, uh, audio in houses of worship. Um, I guess just a quick note on that, you know, once you get comfortable behind the board, I think um, everyone has their own personal ideas and uh, Audio can be very um, a matter of personal opinion, and, and everyone has their own ideas of what sounds good. Um, and just always want to keep in mind that this is not a rock concert. You know, we're here for worship, and um, the points that are kind of driven home in these um, in these handouts are, you know, stressing clarity over everything else, basically, because that's. Um, we want to be able to hear every instrument. We want to be able to hear the lead vocals. We want to be able to, you know, hear the enunciation of every syllable if possible, and recreate the sound and enforce it, or reinforce it um, as accurately as possible. So that's the goal. Um, <clears throat> today we're going to start off with signal flow because I think there's a lot of under a misunderstanding. And yeah, uh, if you could go to the next slide there for me. Um, just a lot of this. This is where things get confusing quick. You know, uh, if you go to the third slide for me. Yep, oh, no, uh, back one. Sorry. So <clears throat> this is just a really simple, basic diagram of some uh, signal flow. So you've got, you know, your instruments at the top there going to the inputs and running through the gain stage, then the EQ stage, then the auxiliary sends. Uh, down to the mains, which then fire off over to the main outputs. Um, and then you've got at the top right of the board there, your auxiliary outputs and your main outputs. Um, so I just want everyone to understand that, you know, the first time I walked up to a 48 channel board and saw all an analog board and saw all these blinking lights and knobs and switches, and I was like, Wow, that's really cool. I have no idea what any of that means, though. Um, how does this work? And I was a little overwhelmed by all these knobs and switches here. But all you got to do is remember that it is just this, however many times the board is built for. So, you know, in this case, what, 16 channel board? So you've got one channel, 
16 times and it's the same thing for every channel. So don't let the sea of knobs confuse you or you know hold you back at all because really all that's happening is, uh, if you could go to the next slide for me, one more, there. This is really difficult to see, I apologize, but at the top you've got your inputs um, and, and every board, whether it's analog or digital, is going to have the same basic function and layout. Um, you're going to have your inputs are going to be the first thing in the, in the uh, signal flow. And then from there, you're going to have a lot of times um, your EQ and then your aux sends, or sometimes those are backwards. Sometimes they have, like in this case, the aux sends come after the gain stage. Um, so yeah, input, then gain, then aux sends, then your EQ, and then your pan, left, right. Uh, and then your main fader for that channel. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and you can think of, you know, a lot of the contemporary digital boards have their aux sends aren't on a knob anymore. They're on another fader, or they're on the fader itself. So you'd flip a page to get to your your auxiliary sends, uh, like with this one, the board you guys are using here. Uh, let's see. But um, are there any questions about, if you could go back to uh, three for me? Okay, so gain, that's going to affect your overall sound level, your overall volume. It attenuates, that's another big word, um, so it will, uh, it cannot ever add signal, because you can't add any signal to a source, but it will attenuate or it will cut signal away from the original signal. Um, does that make the volume go lower? Uh, yeah, so your gain it affects the volume for everything that follows after that. So, oh, okay. So it'll, it'll affect the, the overall volume of everything. But so, it can only go down. Correct, yep. So gain is like volume down for everything. Yeah, it, you will use it for volume up as well, though. Yes. Okay, but there's like a max cap. Yeah, max. in a pure electrical okay. sense, it cannot add voltage. Gotcha. So, um, okay, so <coughs> the gain though, basically, so that's your master overall volume for everything. Um, and that comes directly after the input, okay? Okay. Um, and then next, in this slide, it shows... The EQ and the aux are reversed from how this board is built, but um, but next on the slide is EQ. Oh, nope, you can stay there. Um, but the next thing on this slide is EQ or equalization. Okay. EQ is used to change how the signal is processed and how it sounds. So you can use it. Um, probably just an example would be even easier to show you. Gonna have some buzz. Do you have music going, or here I can. Or I can just do it here. Yeah. Where are we put? It's, it's right here. It's on. Check, check. All right. So <coughs> you can just talk. I'll just. Yeah. So I'm just gonna talk and have. You, you can tell here is really muffled and no. Nope, now all the bass is gone. Now it's getting really tinny. Check, 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 so check, 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 bass. check. Yep. yep. Okay. It's gonna. Um, it stands for equalization, so the point of having it is to equalize the frequency response so that it is natural or it is true all the way across the frequency spectrum. Okay, fair. <laughs> um, and the, I think the difference between this and treble and bass is treble and bass is two, set. two levels, Yep. and this just has a spectrum of a lot of smaller channels where you can tweak things a little more precisely. The more channels you have, right. the more you divide this full spectrum of bass to treble up into, right. the more uh, processing you have. Check. So okay. It's the same thing, it's just in a lot more narrow bandwidths of, of signal. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I didn't bring, I should have shown something that can show the full speak uh, frequency spectrum, but I didn't plan to get too much into EQing today because honestly, I could spend a month on EQing. <laughs> um, but if you visualize um, bass to treble, or if, in your case, bass to treble um, across the entire frequency spectrum, you've got 
you start at the low lows, an inaudible bass. It's so low you can't hear it. it travels up all the way up to the other end of the spectrum, which is you know treble, which is so high that you can't hear it. Um, and that's what we're affecting with the EQ. So we are grabbing a part of the frequency and say it's at you know four kilohertz, okay. And first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, and then there's gain for each frequency. So you center the frequency on what you want to affect first, and then you would bring the gain for that frequency up or down to until it starts to sound natural. Now, if I do this, yeah, so all those knobs on the EQ are they just different? sections of the spectrum of frequencies yep. Yep. that you're basically amplifying or attenuating? Yeah, so the better boards are going to have more yeah. chunks of the frequency spectrum that you can affect at once. So they might have a five band EQ, whereas this has, what, two or three bands? So um, let me show you something. This is going to hurt. I'm going to apologize in, in advance, but it's muted there. it will show you Check, 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 check. Exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, check, check. That's feedback. That was a little hot. A little hot, so we'll... I just want to get this to ring. Check, it's check. Too good of a speaker. Well, later if there's time we can go through ringing out monitors, because I know that was something Schmidt wanted to do today anyway, if we could. Um, but basically, Just shut up. you can, so that loud sound you heard, if, um, I can use software or just my ears to tell where that is in this frequency spectrum and I can EQ that out so that basically I can come up to it again and do the same thing and it wouldn't make any noise at all. So that's the goal. Um, there's a lot of different ways to EQ, a lot of different forms of EQing, and, um, but what you're going to be more um, concerned with is EQing instruments and vocals. Um, and so, uh, like I said, I could go on for that stuff for a month, but yeah. Next one down. Um, next one down is the aux sends. So that's auxiliary sends. So it's another set of outputs um, outside of the main outputs that go to the, the main speakers. So auxins are typically used for monitors, like stage wedges. You can see here where it says uh, you've got your aux here, and then you see the line, and I apologize with shaky hands, going out of the aux out to an amplifier to the stage wedges. Um, so it splits the signal off from the main sends, which go here, and it sends only that channel to the aux out. <coughs> On our board here, and a lot of the digital boards, it's called mix out. They don't have aux oh, anymore. Okay. It's only called mix. Sure. So it's it's because 99% of the time you're going to be using the aux sends as a mix for your musicians or your, you know your. So those are for like the ones yep. on stage that they need to hear like the monitor yep. speakers. Okay. Yep. So uh, and then last in the signal flow on a board is the mains. So you have the faders for each channel and this is where you create your mix that is heard through the main speakers and that is sent to the main outputs. So if I have the mains all the way down I can have these all the way up and hit these, turn everything on, crank it up as much as I want. I'm never going to hear anything because it's not it's all being sent to nothing here at the main outputs. Mm -hmm. So you have You could to hear have, it through the monitors. You'd see yeah, you would hear the it through the monitors. Because those are independent of the main mix. Okay. But um, without the mains being up, you're not going to hear anything out of the main speakers. So those bottom like sliders? Yep. What's the difference between those and the gain knob? Okay, like I mentioned earlier, the gain or trim, that affects everything in the signal path after it. So if I'm adjusting the fader here, that is being sent to the mains, 
and out to the main speakers. Now if I adjust the trim here though, <coughs> instead of using the fader, now I'm affecting everything. I'm affecting the EQ and the aux send as well. So I'm going to be, if I crank up the gain here, I'm going to be cranking up the stage wedges as well, which is not what you want to have happen because once you get your stage wedges set, you want to leave them. Yeah. Um, it's a wedge. Uh, just these guys. Okay. Um, we just call them wedges. Yeah. Okay. Um, so once you're, that's why you always start top to bottom. When you're mixing, follow the signal path. Start at the input. Start at your gain. Um, get your gain set first, and then don't touch it. Is the goal to minimize how high you need your gain, kind of? Yes. Yeah, because the higher the, the gain, noise. no, yeah, you're introducing more noise. You're introducing. Um, more problems um, you want to have um, and you want to leave headroom you, is everyone familiar with the concept of headroom sure um, so you want it to be loud enough to hear it without um, overdriving the circuit and introducing noise um, or um, yeah <laughs> without introducing any more noise or making it worse uh, and then if you, like I said, if you, if once you've already got your aux end set for each stage wedge, for instance, you don't want to touch this again because if I go and crank the gain up, um, I'm probably going to have what I just showed you <laughs> feedback happen because um, those are already set for, to a certain level. So any more questions on that slide? I got a question. Yeah. So... Um, my role in doing this would be for hip hop. Yep. It wouldn't be for contemporary worship. Mm -hmm. And we do an open mic here that's hip hop based, like concert type. Mm -hmm. And the mix is always, it's just not, it's just not a hip hop mix. I don't necessarily, I know what it sounds like, but I don't necessarily know how to make it get there. Sure. Yeah. I understand. So I don't know if that has to do with like EQ or what, like. It's probably all of it, you know, okay. EQ, gains, um, you know, you're, uh, depending on the type of music, that just kind of comes with experience, honestly, knowing what you want it to sound like and then being able to get it there. Um, it just comes with time and knowing the, knowing the bands, knowing the musicians and the, the, um, that's a good example where it's so subjective depending right. on who's running it. If I'm running it, if someone else is running it, um, if a guy who's doing hip hop all the time who has younger ears, I can't hear it over like 14,000 cycles. So, but you don't care about those frequencies, you want the low ones. The other thing about that is, I mean, if you want to get closer to that, I think the main thing we need to do is just come in here and start doing it until yeah. you hear what you need. Because yeah. Steve and I can do a lot of that, we just don't know what you're looking for, and if you don't know how to articulate it, it's just a matter of time of sitting down right, and, right. I need more of this, and I need less of this, and I need more of this, and we can, we've got the processing to dial it in to what you want in here. So right. We just need some time, and you going through this to articulate better, right. and us being in here with you, hearing what you're looking for is, is a good stuff to step to getting it where you want it. Yeah. And that, like you said, that Allen and Heath board has definitely has the processing power and the EQ and everything for um, tailoring the sound to just what you want to hear. Uh, and this is a very good system. Um, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem to get it where you want it. It's just a matter of, like I said, articulating. Once, once it would here. get there, it, can you save that like, yep. so you don't have to remix it? Lock it in, and there you go. The next time you show up, hit recall, and you're up and running. Um, who here is afraid of snakes? <laughs> if you can go to slide four for me. Uh, that's an audio snake. So um, I remember I, I brought this picture because when I first started off with church audio, I was a little bit confused. We had four or five different snakes up on stage. You know, they had stuff plugged in in different orders, and I didn't understand the <clears throat> signal routing and what this thing was doing. Don't be afraid of snakes. It's just an extension cord. All it's doing is taking 
the signal from, say, the drums and over to the board rather than having to bring the board over to the drums. Um, but the one that's shown here, uh, it looks like it's a 16 by 8 snake. So the top 16 ports or the top 16, uh, those are inputs. And then the bottom eight, those are outputs. And these are, it looks like they're run parallel. So you've got XLR and TRS um, run in parallel for the output. So um, you could use either one depending on what gear you're hooking up to that. But um, basically they're just long extension cords for audio gear. Um, and you have, your snakes are built into the stage? Right? Some are, some, we have one up there. Okay. Um, but yeah, we can definitely go over that a little bit too and kind of show everybody, okay, it starts at this microphone, goes to this input on the snake, and then from that input on the snake, it goes back to channel whatever on the board because it may not be linear. It may not be um, channel one on the snake goes to channel one on the board. It's Maybe. definitely not. It, it, yeah, <laughs> and that's why it was confusing <laughs> to me, and that's why I bring this up. But you have reasons for that, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. As long as there's reasons, <laughs> it's all good. What well, would, would... Wait, what? I'm confused by Okay, so say, for instance, you've got channel... It should be, like, channel one going to one? No. It's not, or it's no, just... It doesn't have to be. Okay, okay. Personal preference, okay. because you can... people plug things in all over the Well, on this place. board, uh, there's an auto mix function on the first eight or 16 channels. So if I use those up with the drum, then if we have a, a panel come up here, and the panel of auto mix will auto mix, that's a whole other thing, but... Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want, like a, like a, if we have a whole oh, conference speakers. where a whole bunch of people are sit, oh, standing like up there, people. Okay. then we have the first eight open to do that uh -huh. as a capability going forward. We we're going to do a full conference with everyone's got their own mic up front and that'll, I don't want to take my drums away. I'd have to unplug my drums then. Sure. So I started at nine with one. Okay. So yeah, channel one yeah. of the snake so would be like the kick drum. Is going into channel nine of the soundboard. Exactly. For instance, yeah, the snake is just numbered so you know which extension cord you're on. Right. It, it has nothing to do with the channels. It's just numbering an extension cord to know what your two ends are, and then you can plug that extension cord into anything you want. Yeah. On the back. So, they so without labels, do you just have to memorize they who are put what? They're everything's right. labeled. They're labeled on both ends. Right. Everything's okay. labeled. So you know what the head is. You know what the tail is. Right. Yeah. Every single one. Oh, and so, uh, yeah, that, I'll bring that up too. You just mentioned this is called the head. Okay. Oh, okay. And this end is called the whip. Okay. Um, so we don't have, okay. So head and whip. Uh, if we could go to slide oh, six. Oh, wait, what are the buttons on the head? Those are just inputs. Those are They're just, just inputs. inputs. Those are oh, are those They're holes all... to plug things Those are into. outputs, yeah. yeah. The bottom section is outputs, the inputs on the top. Oh, okay. This is a good time for this, I think. So, if you look at... What's the difference between the top inputs and the bottom inputs? We're one's, getting there. One's outputs. Okay. Yeah, one's oh, outputs. Inputs, yeah. So, oh, gotcha. there's okay. the top 16. If you can tell, those are all female XLR. Those are inputs. So this you would plug into the board. That's your input. Okay. See? And then the male. This, I want to use this to send to my monitor. Right. This actually would be a, a female end then. I've mm. got... This would go there on the output on the bottom section. Okay. And now that go is an output. Okay. So... Who decided who was male and female? So it's just like nature. <laughs> I know, I'm just kidding. No, I'm, I, that, I, that's a point I was going to bring up. Um, XLR, male and female, how do you know which one's input and which one's output? It's just like nature. Okay. Output is male, input is female. Uh, if you could go to slide six and seven. So, we have, there's mainly two kinds of microphones that you're ever going to deal with, and those are dynamic and condenser microphones. The one that I was just playing with here is a Shure SM58 probably one of the most common uh, dynamic mics you'll ever see. Uh, they're used everywhere. <laughs> um, so what's the difference between, and then you have a condenser mics as well, like the podium mic 
and your kick drum mic, those are condenser mics. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important to understand the difference and you know how they function and how they're used. But um, so dynamic and condenser can describe the operating principle used in a microphone. The operating principle is the type of conducer or transducer inside the microphone. That is how the microphone picks up sound and converts it into an electrical signal. So all it does is changes one form of energy into another. That's all a microphone does. Um, a transducer is a device that changes energy from one form into another. In this case, acoustical energy <coughs> into electrical energy. The operating principle determines some of the basic uh, capabilities of the microphone. The two most common types are dynamic and condensers. Uh, if you could go to slide eight. So this is a cutaway of a um, dynamic microphone. They have a diaphragm, a voice coil, and a magnet, and that forms a sound-driven electrical generator. Basically, this is, if you were to take this apart, um, and you can, you can, you know, pretty easily. Is that dynamic or condenser? Dynamic. Okay. Yep. This is dynamic. These are the more common, more rugged types. So, if you take off, this is the windscreen. Um, please don't ever do this. If you are using a microphone, don't do this. I hate this. It makes me want to shoot people. They have a handle for a reason. <laughs> if you see people doing this, try to. <laughs> if you see people doing this, please try to correct them in a you know any way you can, because this is a this is the handle right here. If you're covering up the microphone. It, but the thing is, that's part of the processing to get a sound. I mean, it's a muffled, odd sound that a rapper wants. So yeah, we'll get to, we'll get to pick up that. They're gonna do that, but it's the pickup pattern. If that's the sound they want, they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but we'll get to the pickup pattern in a minute. Yeah, we'll get up we'll get up to why that is important in a second here. Um, but there's a windscreen, this piece of foam here, and then inside of there is a diaphragm. Basically, it's a tiny little speaker. This is how speakers are built, too. If you were to reverse the signal, you could get sound to come out of this if there wasn't a diode inside of it. Um, in fact, I've used, micro, I've used headphones as microphones before. So, um, in a pinch, that does work. All right, so, with dynamic microphones they have a small coil of wire that's called the voice coil um, so what happens when the dia when the sound hits the diaphragm the diaphragm moves it starts to vibrate and it starts to slide the voice coil through a magnetic field at the same time and when it does that the it creates an electromagnetic signal which is then passed down the wire um, so Pretty basic, pretty simple. That's why they're so common. That's why they're used just about everywhere. Um, and then, uh, next slide please, nine. Dynamic microphones have relatively simple construction and are therefore economical and rugged. Uh, I've never seen an SM58 that didn't have a dent from being dropped, <laughs> unless it was brand new. <laughs> These things are pretty much bulletproof. Um, doesn't mean go ahead and throw them around, but they are very rugged. Um, they can provide very excellent sound quality uh, in all areas of microphone performance. In particular, they can handle extremely high sound levels. It's almost impossible to overload a dynamic microphone. In addition, dynamic microphones are relatively unaffected by extremes of temperature and humidity. Dynamics are the type of most li widely used in sound, general sound reinforcement uh, because of this. They're cheap, they're rugged, they sound good. Um, now the next type, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is uh, condenser mics. These are a little more touchy. Um, they're uh, more sensitive generally, and <clears throat> we'll get into why here. So yeah, condenser mics are based on an electrically charged diaphragm and backplate assembly which forms a sound sensitive capacitor. Sound waves vibrate a very thin metal or metal coated plastic diaphragm. The diaphragm is mounted just in front of a rigid metal or metal coated ceramic backplate. 
In electrical terms, this assembly or element is known as a capacitor, which is also historically known as a condenser, um, which has the ability to store a charge of voltage. So when this element is charged, an electrical field is created between the diaphragm and the back plate, proportional to the spacing between them. So it's this, this spacing between the two that um, is used to create the electrical signal. Um, so it's a variation of the spacing due to the motion of the diaphragm relative to the back plate that produces the electrical signal corresponding to the sound picked up by the condenser microphone. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the construction of condenser microphones must include some provision for maintaining an electrical charge uh, or polarizing voltage. Uh, an electric condenser microphone has a permanent charge maintained by a special material deposited on the back plate of the diaphragm. Some of this is a little heady, I apologize. Um, Preach, keep going. <laughs> uh, Non-electric types are charged or polarized by means of an external power source. The majority of condenser microphones for sound reinforcement are the electric type. Um, all, condenser, all condensers contain additional active circuitry to allow the electrical output of the element to be used with typical microphone inputs. This requires that all condenser microphones be powered. That's the main difference between a condenser and a dynamic mic. Condenser mics must have power provided to them, either by a battery or by phantom power. Mm -hmm. um, so, <clears throat> this, yep. So they have to be plugged into a power source? Correct. Yep. But dynamic mics don't? Right. Yep. So dynamic mics just use the motion of the, vi the sound waves hitting the diaphragm uh, to move a voice coil through a magnetic field. So and one's physical, one's electric. Yep. Yeah, okay. basically, if you want to think of it that the way. The electric signal is still passed over a cable to the soundboard. Yes. Unless yes. it's a wireless one. Yes. We mm -hmm. have a battery still to send the signal. Um, so wireless mics are totally different. We're not going to touch on wireless mics today. Goodness. But <laughs> But there are both dynamic and condenser wireless mics as well. So we're just talking wired mics today. Um, yeah, we didn't want to get into RF. We only have today. <laughs> yeah. RF and all that stuff today. But So, um, the two potential limitations of condenser microphones due to the additional circuitry. First, the electronics produce a small amount of noise. So, they inherently introduce some noise into the circuitry. Um, second, there is a limit to the maximum signal level that the electronics can handle. For this reason, condenser microphone specifications always include a, noise, include a noise figure and a maximum sound level. Good designs, however, have very low noise levels and are capable of very wide dynamic range. Um, slide 12, please. Condenser microphones are more complex than dynamics and tend to be somewhat more costly. Uh, also, condensers may be adversely affected by extremes of temperature and humidity which can cause them to become noisy or fail temporarily. However, condensers can readily be made with higher sensitivity and can provide a smoother, more natural sound, particularly at high frequencies. Uh, flat frequency response and extended frequency range are much easier to obtain with a condenser mic. In addition, the condenser microphone can be made very small without significant loss of performance. So if you're watching the news, uh, all the talking heads there are, have a tiny, tiny little mic clipped to their lapel usually, and um, those are always a condenser mic. They're very small, and those are an omnidirectional condenser mic. Um, whereas, you know, here, uh, the podium mic, it's a little bit larger, but it's still much smaller than this, right? Um, that's a condenser mic. This is dynamic. Um, so... Uh, you can have, uh, there's potential with a condenser mic to have a much cleaner signal, a much cleaner sound, much more flat response. Whereas um, uh, when I hear an SM58, I know it's an SM58 without even seeing it. I can tell what it sounds like just because I've heard them so many times in a live setting. They, they do color the sound a little bit. 
um, whereas a condenser mic is going to be much more pure and true to the source. Um, yeah, any questions? <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> All right. All right, let's go now to uh, slide 13 and Polaroid, or sorry, cardioid polar pattern. So in this slide, I don't know if everybody can see that okay, but that is an SN58. That's this mic right here. So um, on the left, you can see exactly where it picks up sound. So it starts here and comes out like this, and then comes back. Do you want to talk on that? Check, check. Yeah, I'll show you. Flip that speaker on, and we can just. So, so the side, <clears throat> side to it. Yeah, this will reject noise and reject sound. So from the front, it's going to pick up just fine. This is why it's important not to do this. But because it's picking up sound from the front and the sides as well. Check, 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 check. And it rejects noise from the rear. And this is good. This is really good here because what is normally pointed What's normally right behind the mic on stage? Monitor. Stage wedge. You got a you got a loud speaker blaring sound this way, and you don't want the microphone picking that back up again. Um, so cardioid polar pattern is good thing to have on stage. What's uh, the buzz coming from? Um, it's just inherent in the no in the board and the cables. Um, you might have a dirty pot or a dirty input. Okay. Uh, it's kind of an older board, it looks like, and it's pretty dusty. But it could be in the cables, it could be picking up noise from the lights. Um, okay, so that's a cardioid polar pattern. They call it that because it's heart shaped. <coughs> uh, if you could go to 14, there's also what they call a super cardioid polar pattern. Uh, I don't have one of these mics here right now, but you can see how the polar how the difference in pickup pattern looks like. Um, so it's a narrower pickup pattern um, than cardioids and a greater rejection of ambient sound, uh, but they have some pickup directly at the rear, hence it is important to place monitor speakers correctly. If you have a super cardioid microphone on stage, you don't want your wedge right here. You want to put it off to the side a little bit and angle it uh, because you can see here it's going to reject noise that right here more. Um, and then the other thing with these two, handling the mic is going to be heard a lot more. You're going to get a lot more uh, mic handling noise if you have someone that's constantly fumbling with the mic because it does pick up right where the handle is. So, um, and then the next slide, omnidirectional polar pattern. Um, so, <clears throat> Just so you know, too, with all of these polar patterns, it doesn't matter if the mic is cardioid, or I'm sorry, is a condenser or a dynamic mic. The polar patterns, you can get both versions of microphones with any of these polar patterns, basically, depending on what you're trying to do. So uh, the omnidirectional is just what it sounds like. It picks up equally all the way around. Uh, sensitive at all angles. It means it picks up sound evenly from all directions. The microphone needs to be aimed in a, so therefore the microphone need not be aimed in a certain direction, which is especially helpful with lavalier microphones. Uh, a disadvantage is that an omni cannot be aimed away from undesired sources such as PA speakers, uh, with, which results in less headroom for feedback, which means Basically, if you have an omnidirectional mic on stage and you're trying to use it as a vocal mic, for instance, you're not going to be able to get much volume out of it before it starts to feed back because it's picking up all the way around. Uh, next slide, please. I have a question. Yeah. This stuff. So how can you tell by looking at the mic which is which kind? Um, usually they'll have a, a tiny little symbol printed on them. Um, a lot of mics have... This one doesn't, but a lot of times it'll have that that symbol. One of these symbols right here, right here printed on the top. Yep. Um, and aside from that, just know your mics, know your gear. That's that's what it comes down to. Um, but yeah, so 
the reason I went through all of this is because I think it's critical that people know what mic to use and what application and when and you know um, and understanding you know wow man why am I getting so much feedback why is this mic just taking off on me what's going on well you know would you have an Omni mic up on stage somewhere or do you have you know a super cardioid or even a heart hypercardioid um, and it's picking up feedback from the wedge um, who knows so yeah uh, Next slide, it was just Q&A. So yeah, you guys have any questions? That has an extra two. line then compared to that one. Right. right. Okay. That yep. was two lines. Right. For that that's three. Balance. Right. So that you wouldn't want to use on a guitar. Because I used to, like, I would go, I would go um, rap at old, like, churches with older stuff, and then they would have their aux cord to my phone, but it would never come through properly. That's probably why. Yeah. So understanding the difference between an unbalanced and a balanced cable is critical because, um, and I'll show you why here in a little bit, um, an unbalanced cables and signals. Unbalanced cable consists of two connectors and two conductors. So this is the one, the one I'm talking about is the, micro, or the uh, guitar cable right now. So it just has the tip and the sleeve. Um, so it has a signal and a ground wire. Uh, you can quickly, in most cases, identify a cable designed to carry an unbalanced signal by its connectors because each wire has to terminate at the connector with its own contact point. An unbalanced cable requires only two conductors at the connector, a standard TS or tip sleeve guitar cable, like the one we passed around, is the unbalanced cable you'll run into on stage. Um, standard RCA, RCA cables are also unbalanced, so um, if you go to the next slide, RCA stands for. Um, that's the company that designed them oh, originally. Fair. Yeah. Fair. So. Um, also phono. Right, or phono cable. But uh, do we have an RCA cable laying around? Yeah. Yeah, like the uh, white, red and white. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, right. So here's. Okay. Well, there's there's your RCA. So right. that's also an unbalanced cable. Um, and so if you look again here, unbalanced, it just has the tip and the sleeve with only the one black ring. But this one's balanced, right? Well, no, but that's, that's, for your, that's a phone. Here. No, it's stereo. Okay, never mind. It's, not even it's stereo. It's left and right. Oh, okay. So one, one of, so your tip ring sleeve, so the, the tip and the ring, the tip would be left channel, the ring would be right channel, and the sleeve would be ground. And then... Go to the next slide there. Inside the cable itself, the signal wire is typically in the center of the cable with the ground wire surrounding it. The ground wire serves to function. It carries part of the audio, audio signal and serves to shield the main signal wire to some degree from outside interference from noise, such as the hum from lights and transformers, as well as RF interference that comes from TV and radio transmissions. It does a decent job of rejecting noise, but unfortunately the wire <coughs> itself also acts as an antenna and picks up noise. Interesting little fact, anytime that you have two wires running in parallel to each other, it's an antenna. It's going to pick up noise, and that's what unbalanced cables do. So in pro audio, we try to not use unbalanced cables as much as possible because they inherently induce noise. Um, and you can see here... It, in the diagram, so you've got the signal there, and I don't know if you can see it there, you've got noise there, and the output is signal and noise together. Um, so that's that's the the problem with unbalanced cables. Uh, if you go to it the also next... helps to keep these cables shorter. Right. Um, when I first started doing sound back when we were, I don't know how long, I found some... Uh, 25 30 footers <laughs> oh man and uh they were running to the guitar oh. and uh you know let's just take those and throw them away or yeah. cut or them cut them in half cut them in half make, make two, two cables yeah, yeah make two of them because <laughs> yeah you really don't want a guitar cable more than about 10 or 12 feet anything above that this is an antenna it's going to pick up noise on stage rf noise all right so the um, the other side of the coin there is balanced cables and um 
we're going to talk about how those work now. So a balanced cable has three conductors instead of two in the connector and three wires in the cable. It has two signal <coughs> wires plus a separate ground wire. Um, as in the unbalanced cable, the ground wire still surrounds the signal wires and is used as a shield against interference. But what makes a balanced cable special is the way the gear util utilizes the extra signal wire. Uh, and here it shows, can't really see it in the slide, but there is a ground wire sticking up right there. So it has two signal wires and a ground wire. So why would you need two signal wires? Um, if you could go to the next slide there. So this is an example of a balanced signal cable or a connector, the TRS. So the one, the guitar pick, the guitar cable I passed around, that's a TS, so tip sleeve. This is a tip ring sleeve. So you have signal there, signal there, and ground there. Um, and the way it uses it, if you can go to the next slide, balance cables use two signal wires. Both carry a copy of the signal, but the two copies are sent in with their polarity reversed. Yeah, basically you can see there on the left is the original signal, on the right is the same signal, but it's flipped. Uh, and the reason we do this is, uh, well, we're getting to it. If you sum the two signals that are identical but are reversed in polarity, the signals cancel out, leaving you with silence. So if you were actually to combine these two signals and send it down a cable, it doesn't matter how loud the original source is, you'd get dead silence. They would cancel each other out. Um, adding the left signal to the inverted copy of itself on the right results in a canceled signal as positive peaks in the original signal <coughs> correspond to equally negative peaks in the, in the inverted signal and vice versa. Okay, so why would you want audio gear that flips the polarity of your signal? Uh, in this case, because the receiving gear will flip the inverted signal back into its original orientation. Okay, so you've got You've got the original signal on the left, right? And the piece of gear that is sending it down the cable flips a copy of it over, sends it down the other signal cable, and then at the other end of the cable, at the receiving gear, the receiving gear takes that inverted copy and flips it back into the original formation, and it adds it back into the original cable. So you have, um, so as it's traveling down the wire, you have silence, right, basically. And it's not until it gets to the receiving piece of gear that it flips it back over, sums it, or adds it back to itself, <clears throat> and then reinforces that original signal. Um, and you might think, man, that's a lot of work. Why would we do that? <laughs> um, because both copies of the signal picked up the same noise as they traveled along the cable, that noise is identical to the two wires in the cable, or on the two wires in the cable. Flipping the polarity of what arrives at the receiving gear will produce the original signal intact and noise which has reversed polarity. If you sum all of that together, it cancels the noise and reinforces the original signal. That's the point. That's how that's how balanced cable works. So, does it flip it at the head of the snake or back here? Or actually, in this case, it would flip it. So it would. The microphone itself will f invert the a copy of the original signal and send it down the second signal wire. Okay. And then the board would flip it, okay. that inverted signal. So as it's going down the cable, it's picking up noise. This is still an antenna. Um, but since it's inverted on one side and original on the other side, and then it's flipped again, you are, you're, you're canceling the noise and reinforcing the signal, if that makes sense. Has everybody got that? All right. So... Uh, the next slide here shows an example of XLR cables. Uh, slide 27. Yep. And this is what we were talking about earlier. This is a male and a female. The male is on the right, the female is on the left. 
And so the male, the one on the right, would be output. The one on the left would be input. Is that always true? If it's done correctly, yes. Yeah. I've seen people not do that correctly, but yeah. So male is output, female is input. Right. And then the next slide here, this shows, it's hard to see again, but... So now this time, this is a balance cable, so we have two signal wires. We have the original signal and the inverted signal. And so, you see where it says signal plus and signal minus? That's kind of a misnomer. It's actually, the, the correct way to talk about this is hot and cold, not positive and negative, because your ground is the true negative. So that's why the cold is the inverted signal, right there. And then you have noise, which is in the same polarity on both, sig on both cables or both wires, and then the output, which after it is flipped again, is just pure output without noise in a perfect world. So as that's being sent down the cable, it's still going to pick up noise, but since we flip it again at the other end and we add the two copies of the, of the original signal back to each other, um, the output is a pure signal. So balanced wiring uses two signal conductors <coughs> plus the ground, allowing noise picked up along the way to be canceled through polarity inversion. Critical concept to, to understand in pro audio gear. Um, so because of this, you know, someone had asked about, you know, is there a better way to make cables? Is there a better way to make some, you know, how can we send it over long cable runs? Um, balance cables, you can go to the next slide. Uh, balance cables can support much longer cable runs, 50 to 100 feet or 15 to 30 meters is not uncommon, even though shorter runs will often use balanced wiring to protect against noise. The wiring for microphones and the interconnect cables between consoles, signal processors, and amps, etc., in a pro sound system or recording studio environment are typically of the balanced variety. Standard connectors designed for use with balanced signals are XLR and TRS, or tip ring sleeve, passed around already. Um, any questions about this? <laughs> Wait, the XLR, is that the three pins? Yeah. Okay. And just so you know, too, XLR is a standard form factor. There are other types of XLR connectors. The only ones we're worried about today are the three pin. Um, but just so you know, there are five pin, seven pin XLR connectors. Those are usually used for like DMX lighting um, and different different applications than what we're talking about. Is there ever boards with like processing of the signals on there and that have noise filtering? Um, not that I'm aware of, not really. Because, you know, the, the goal of the soundboard is to reproduce as accurately as possible what is sent into it. You know, it's your, your noise cancellation and that sort of stuff should come, come before the board. So what's a DI box and why do I need one? Um, passing one around there, you can see. So the primary function of DI boxes is, is to take an unbalanced high impedance signal and convert it to a balanced low impedance signal. Signal. This allows you to run guitar and bass directly into a microphone preamps, or in this case the preamps of a soundboard, um, or to send signal over extended cable runs without losing volume and significant high frequency information. Um, Next slide there shows how that's connected. So in this case, that looks to me like a bass guitar setup. You've got um, the guitar going directly into the DI box, and then it shows that symbol right there is a transformer. Um, and I'll let you Google how a transformer works on your own. I don't feel like going into that. Uh, but it's also splitting the signal out and going to the amp on stage, which the musician is using as a monitor. But um, the trans, or sorry, the uh, what transformer. transformer 
will convert the signal from unbalanced guitar signal to a balanced signal, which can then be sent down the snake to the soundboard, which can then be sent out <coughs> to the speakers or the amplifier. It so it's not changing the signal. Yeah, it would be the same as di directly plugging right into the amp without the DI. And that, so like for this example, that amp is taking the place of your mixer or wedge? Speaker, nope. Or no? Well, only taking the place of a wedge. This is only, this what amp is only... the aux? Huh? The aux output? There was another name... You could use mix out, mix, mix out. out. So mix out usually refers to the onstage wedge speakers. Usually, yeah. Yep. So instead of right now, he's using that amp directly from his guitar, pretty much through this thing. Yep. Instead and of a wedge only a, exactly, yeah, okay. yep. So he would be mixing himself. So there's nothing going through. Yeah, nothing's going through the board. Back right. To him. Right. Correct. In this in this setup, correct. Yeah. Um, Okay. So then the challenge there is to make sure that he has it as loud as he needs, but he Not doesn't too overpower the rest of the system. Because yeah. in a room like this, that bass can yeah, it overpower would. everything that we can do from the board, and then we have no control. If we, if we want to bring it down, we, we have no control over it. So bring it down, because these were controlling it. So yeah. we, we want them to have the sound that they want, to hear what they need on the stage, and control that. But then we also need them to have it low enough I can turn it up or yeah. turn it down from, from the board. So in this configuration, yes, he could be controlling the whole room if he cranks it up too much. So that's where we need to you know, have a, in the morning, that's what we're trying to listen for. Yeah. If, if I can't control anything in the bass, I've got to get up there, talk to him, turn it down, and start getting control over the balance. Otherwise, when we start going at the start of the service, we got nothing. That brings up an interesting point, control. Yeah. This guy, <laughs> this guy, or you, if you're on that, you're in control. Right. And sometimes you have to say, stop, you turn off everything, and you say, you have to listen to me now. And you ha we actually have a microphone back there where you can talk to them on the stage monitor or in the mains. But you have to take control. If you're lost, and you don't know what you're doing, or if you do know what you're doing, and you want to control them and tell them they're messing up some in some way or fashion, you're the one in control. You can't make them sound better, but you can make them sound worse by not doing anything and taking control. So that's one of the tools we're giving you here. But a good example of that is that, that bass. If he's just blasting us out and we can't do anything about it, we don't do this. We say, hey, you got to turn your amp down. Right. you got to do it. I'm yeah. telling you to do There's, it. You're going to do it. So, any, anything you, you can know. do... Well, you, turn them off. you turn everything off until they listen to you. <laughs> if... Um, Anything you can do to minimize stage volume as much as possible is always going to help your mix. So this setup here is not ideal for church because of what we just talked about. You're going to see this in nightclubs, on big concerts, things like that. Um, but in church, for the most part, we want to have everybody on in-ears or on their own little wedge, and he can monitor himself that way versus having a giant rack of speakers and a big head amp um, to blast a bass because then, like you said, it would wash everything out. So stage volume comes from the noise they're actually making plus the monitors? Exactly. Yep. Is there any other source of stage volume? Um, yeah, it's mainly the wedges and the, the instruments themselves. That's why we have the fishbowl for the, drum, for the drummers um, is to minimize stage volume because that allows um, you to control the mix that much greater uh, and control the overall volume. If, if somebody has a big bass amp like that up on stage, I'm now for that becomes the loudest thing in the room and I'm forced to mix everything else around that source, around that bass amp. And that's gonna make everything really loud really fast and in, it would not usually ideal for church. You know, we're not pushing 130 decibels here. <laughs> so, okay, so let's, uh, yeah, next slide, please. No, I have a question, actually, one more. Uh, sure. Power doesn't come from the board to the speakers, right? They're powered separately with an outlet? Um, no, correct, right, yeah. They, so, like, these speakers have built-in amplifiers, is that what you mean? He means where's the power source? Well, I just mean like 
the yeah the the high voltage that powers everything in your monitor speakers. Oh no, those come from amplifiers after the board. So the board is sending that power. Nope. The board doesn't the send power at all. Monitors have to be oh, plugged in. Oh, fan yep. power. That's what they I put that's on you. They actually so. plug into the stage usually. So it's just the signal that goes in and out of the board. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, okay. So there's there's different types of DIs or direct injection boxes. Um, there's passive DIs. Those are the most common ones you're going to see. Um, most passive DIs are typically used typically use a form of Balin transformer to convert high impedance signal to low impedance signal. So it's that transformer that's converting from unbalanced to balanced. Okay. This style of transformer features electrically separate windings in the input and output stages which isolate ground level voltages and eliminate ground loops. So they, the way a transformer works, I know I just said I wasn't going to talk about this, <laughs> but <laughs> It's basically a magnet with some copper windings around it. And there's two sides. There's two of those with a gap between them. So rather than a... Uh, the other way of doing it would just be use a straight-through cable, right? You've got a piece of cable running the signal from one side to the other. Well, with transformers, it converts... Uh, those, those magnets convert the signal into an electromagnetic field and that signal is passed between the two um, sides of the transformer and by doing that it cleans out noise so you're, you're breaking the signal from it being physically sent along copper and it's now being sent over an electromagnetic field mm -hmm. so it that's how it um, that plus some other Electrical wizardry is how it converts from unbalanced to balanced, but the main point is that it also scrubs out noise. Uh, so they're pretty magical little boxes. <laughs> so even if you have a long guitar cable after a DI, it'll probably get rid of most of that noise? Or? Yeah, it'll clean it up, um, you know, depending on the type and style of the DI, and, you know, it, they can help, but it's not going to get rid of everything. Um, so the result is that the signal is, signal is both impedance matched for a standard light <coughs> pre-out and free from ground hum originating at the input stage. Passive DIs are ideal for instruments with strong outputs, and both their low cost and durability make them the most popular kind of direct injection box. <coughs> um, the other kind is an active DI. Uh, yours is active, right? Yep. yep. So. You turn it on, it has a battery, it has its own power source. That's how we know it's active. <clears throat> the difference between an active DI and a passive DI is that an active DI includes a preamp. Uh, this type of DI was originally designed to provide an extra gain stage to boost the weak output of some passive single coil pickups. But the extra gain is great for driving long cable runs, and many modern active DIs include advanced signal routing capabilities and higher headroom than their passive counterparts, making them an excellent choice for keyboards and instruments with active pickups. So we were talking about pickups a little bit ago, about guitar pickups and the different styles. There are active and passive guitar pickups as well. Mm -hmm. um, that means how the signal is generated from the instrument? Yep, yep. So active means powered, passive means it doesn't need power. Um, <clears throat> so the circuitry onboard Active DIs requires power, which can come via batteries, a dedicated power supply, or 48 volt phantom power, depending on the, mo on the model. Also, because they're technically more complex than passive DIs, active DIs usually cost a bit more. A lot more. <laughs> um, so, go to the next slide. What to look for in a DI. Um, there are multiple channel models. Those are great for keyboards or stereo inputs or like you were talking about with your phone earlier because um, uh, that would be a stereo signal. So we, you, ha we have one on stage we'll look at later. <clears throat> yeah, so multi-channel DIs. Uh, while single-channel DIs are still the most common type on the market, multi-channel versions are hardly rare. There are even rack-mounted DI units for large stage rigs that regularly feature eight or more DI channels. 
We got rid of one of those at KSDP a while back. Yeah, there. we just went to these, just easier. Yep. Direct boxes with two channels are ideal for keyboards and other electronic instruments because they're stereo. You need two channels, a left and a right. Whereas special DI boxes for computers and media players can make it connecting laptops and mobile devices to your PA totally painless. I don't know about that, but... <laughs> All right. So the through, or short for throughput, or bypass, splits the original incoming instrument level signal to a separate quarter inch output. This allows the unprocessed signal to be sent to an amplifier on stage, as well as to the PA via the balanced XLR output. So that's what we sh were showing in the slide earlier with the bass player. Uh, this is particularly useful for bass, which allows the bass player to use an amplifier only for on-stage monitoring, thereby dramatically decreasing stage volume. I don't know about that. Bypasses can be fully passive, and some active DIs are buffered to allow for longer cable runs or effects pedal ground chains. Uh, ground lift, a lot of them have a ground lift button on there. I think that one does. Um, what is that? Well, although direct boxes can do wonders to reduce or eliminate the external noise that plagues unbalanced instrument level signals, even balanced audio equipment can be susceptible to hum and buzz caused by ground loops. The switchable ground lift lets you disconnect pin 1 from the XLR jack of the DI box, preventing current from flowing between the DI and the microphone preamp along the, shielded, along the shielding, thereby breaking the ground loop and eliminating the noise. And I did hand out, uh, one of these handouts oh, is called Pin 1 Revisited. Okay. Um, that talks about ground loops and hums and why you would want to use um, a ground lift. Um, so basically if you're, if you're getting a bunch of hum and noise from something that's using a DI box, First thing you want to try is that ground lift, and see if that and cures that's it. that's just a switch on the box. Yep. Okay. Some DI boxes feature a switchable attenuator called a pad to prevent excessive gain from overloading the circuitry. This circuit decreases incoming signal by a fixed amount of, you know, 15 or 20 dB. Pads are common uh, to accommodate high output of active pickups and unbalanced line level equipment such as keyboards and other electronic instruments. So, I don't know if you, um, everybody understood exactly what all that means. The nope. um, high output of active pickups and unbalanced line level. Does everyone know what line level means? Say it. Um, so line level versus mic level. Probably should have touched on that too. Um, mic level. Inputs, uh, what are, I'd have to look up the specs, but I think it's, you know, minus 3 dB, and then line level is what, plus 4 dB or something like that? What's dB? Decibels. Oh, okay. Um, it's also voltage. You, you can read it in voltage too, but it's... Yeah, amazing. yeah, it gets pretty uh, mathematically intense pretty quick. So they're just levels of decibels? Levels of, levels of signal. Yep. Oh, I've so a line level equipment would be like a CD player um, or uh, a keyboard. So it's it's something that's it's a powered or active um, pickup or uh, you know an active way of sending the signal um, versus a passive way of sending the signal, which would be more like a mic level. Pin 1 is ground, pin 2 is hot, pin 3 is cold. Well, the phase inversion will just do this. So now pin 3 is hot, pin 2 is cold. Uh, why would you want to do that? Well, in addition to correcting for wrongly wired XLR cables, a polarity reverse switch can align the absolute polarity of a direct signal with that of a microphone on the same source. A bass and acoustic guitar Recording technique often used in studios. Um, polarity reverse can also help prevent feedback and is a handy feature to have in case the mixer channel isn't equipped with a polarity reverse. I use that all the time. That's one of the first things I try if I'm getting feedback on a guitar. Flip the polarity. Um, because now you're uh, changing 
All right, so I've got a guitar strumming along. Doom, 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 doom. That's outputting acoustically as in through the air a certain polarity, right? Well, when you plug in, now I'm going to reverse that polarity, so it's sending the opposite polarity through the stage wedge. So they cancel each other out. Um. Understanding it takes a little more work. Um, Phantom power is used with condenser microphones like we talked about earlier. It's called Phantom because there is no uh, obvious external power supply for the condenser mic. Uh, the power supply is invisible and therefore a Phantom. The mixer sends voltage up the same wires that the audio is traveling down. Thus, the microphone is receiving the power remotely from the mixer. Also, DI boxes use phantom power a lot, too. Um, so that's something to look for. In fact, this one, you can power this one via phantom power or by the battery. So if you don't want to use the battery in it, it's a lot safer during a show. You don't want your battery dying uh, right in the middle of worship or something. So it'd be better to power that via phantom power. So phantom power is a DC voltage, usually between 12 and 48 volts. It's actually, you know, it's specced out as 48 volts. Uh, used to power the electronics of a condenser mic. Uh, for some non-electric condensers, it may be also be used to provide the polarizing voltage of the element itself. This voltage is supplied through the microphone cable by a mixer equipped with phantom power or by some type of inline external source. So they, they do have phantom power injectors that you can buy too. If your board doesn't have phantom power, um, you can plug that in in line on the XLR cable and it will provide power. Uh, the voltage is equal on pins two and three on a typical balanced XLR type connector. Uh, for a 48 volt phantom source, for example, pin two is 48 volts and pin three is 48 volts. Both both in respect to pin one, which is ground or shield. Uh, next slide. So there's a diagram of how that works. Uh, you see pin two and pin three there getting 48 volts um, running through a transformer and then the input. So because the voltage is exactly the same on pins two and pin three, phantom power will have no effect on balanced dynamic microphones. No current will flow since there is no voltage difference across the output. In fact, the phantom power supplies have current limiting, which will prevent damage to a dynamic microphone. So what they're saying there is that it doesn't hurt to have phantom power on if your microphone is dynamic rather than a condenser. It doesn't hurt a dynamic mic. to. It just won't use it. So uh, in general... Yeah, balanced dynamic microphones can be connected to a phantom power mixer inputs with no problem. Um, well, all I had ne left after this was uh, cable management, troubleshooting, a little bit about mix theory and Q and A. Break. So break. Take lunch. <laughs> no, Brain's hurting. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> Does everybody understand the difference between analog and digital audio, or analog and digital anything? So analog means just that it's a pure, like, in relation to audio, um, an analog signal would be like what I drew here, just a pure sine wave This is, is what this is called. Um, of current. Yes, of current. So, um, well, or, yeah, we'll keep it to current for right now. So, <laughs> um, basically, this would be representing the movement of the diaphragm in the microphone in and out, basically. And a digital representation of that would be something like this, where it's stepped, because um, basically, you know, computers don't understand anything except ones and zeros, right? So it would just be ones and zeros. So an, a digital signal of this would look something like this. Uh, this is grossly dumbed down uh, because you have what's called analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters and their job is to try to round this out as much as possible while still using just ones and zeros. So I uh, did want to just touch on that. Is there any questions on analog and digital signals at all? This is another one we could spend weeks on because it encompasses everything we've covered today plus more basically. 
Um, understanding signal flow is the fastest way to understand how to troubleshoot. So knowing, you know, <clears throat> where your signal is originating and where it's going next, um, that's going to help you tremendously in troubleshooting how or, you know, where to find a problem and how to fix it. <clears throat> so, um, you know, basically, if I've got a hum or a buzz or something, or I'm not getting signal from something that I should be, uh, first place I always start is at the source. And I follow mentally the signal and say, okay, where is it going? What's it routing through? Oh, I forgot to turn phantom power onto that DI box. Boom, there it is. Okay, now we got signal again. Or, you know, I'm getting a really bad hum or buzz on that guitar. Well, let's try flipping the polarity on it again and see if that changes it. Let's try EQing it out if we can. Um, and, you know, if I have <clears throat> a, a specific frequency that I'm hearing that I really don't want, I can EQ that out. And I can do that with, um, with the board itself a lot of times. Um, or is everything affected equally? Am I hearing something in the mains that is across, it's on every single channel. What is it that's going on here? Why, why am I hearing it on every channel? Well, maybe it's not something in the inputs. Maybe it's on the output stage. Maybe I've got an amp that's going bad or something. Um, so, I mean, we could really spend a lot of time on troubleshooting and it's hard to recreate issues <laughs> like that, but um, I don't know how in depth you want to get into troubleshooting because we could I could leave the room have you mess with a bunch of stuff and see how long it takes me to figure it out and fix it but <laughs> um, no let's have these people do it. Uh, yeah I would echo that it's, it's easy to panic when you start when something's going wrong you yeah. panic and you start jumping at little things oh I've seen this wrong before and you jump in oh that's not it oh that's not it right you need to just back off start at the source so you're not hearing your guitar he plucks a string. You're getting sound out of the string. I mean, that seems silly, but is he is he is the string broke? Is there something weird there? His amps. Is, does he have a battery in his guitar that he needs? Right. Getting a signal out. Then follow that cable. Physically follow it. Is it unplugged somewhere? Does it go to a DI box? Is the or DI you don't. Let's say you don't hear the you don't hear the guitar, but he hears the guitar in his monitor. Right. So the signal's getting into the system because it's getting back to his monitor. But we don't hear it there, right? So it's got to be after. So you, you can know. cut you can cut chunks of, of that signal pathway out by logically thinking it through. But if you're not used to it enough, you might not think of the fact that oh, if I can hear it up there, it has to be getting through and back up there. Still, if if you're starting out, trace it step by step. You know, tune out people complaining and everything. Just go step by step till you get it to the board, and then step by step till you get it out, and then maybe it's processing the board, and maybe it's something you, you can't fix, but that's the only way that you're, you're going to trace it, is it, step if by step. It's on the board, you can see it, right? Well, I mean, there's a lot of digital stuff in there, and that's where playing around with it on a Sunday morning with Steve or I or Hudson or somebody that's done it more, that's where you start seeing where things could go, where something could just be shut off. I mean, and that's what like Steve's talking about. It's not. It's going to a monitor, but it's not going to the mains. Well, the mains might be turned off. You know, and so it, I, I think Ian's point. I just don't. I, I wanted to hit it again. Is I've gotten frustrated before trying to troubleshoot something because we're trying to start a service and it's not working. And either I've calmed down enough to troubleshoot it and figure it out before the service by going back to the source to the to the end. Or afterwards, it's always been that most methodical starting following that signal path, and that's where you're going to find where it could be, and you'll, and you'll fix it. So just breathing and doing it. You've got a whole room full of people that could be staring at you, and you just got to ignore them and, and do what you know what you can do, and eventually you'll either fix it or you won't. And if you don't, you know, you move on and figure something else out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Troubleshooting, again, just stay level-headed and try to understand signal flow, and that'll be your, your best bet. Um, try to understand where it starts, where it goes from there. Um, we had kind of gone up on stage already a little bit and showed how it goes from the 
you know, from the bass player into the DI and then from there into the amp and into the snake and where it goes from there. So uh, we make it sound as natural as possible and try to make, uh, try to recreate and reinforce the natural sound of the drum itself without changing it. And so um, <clears throat> if you look back at the mics that are being used back there, you've got, I don't know, probably three or four different kinds of mics. Um, you've got condensers and you've got uh, dynamic mics um, and they're placed where they're placed for a reason you know if you go look at them go sit down on go sit down on the throne the drum throne once and and look at how it's all set up um, I don't know what you want me to I guess mic to. placement we, we yeah. just kind of launched into that a little bit but yeah it'd probably be easiest just to have each person okay. just sit in there and look and see it 